Welcome to the Peace Catalyst podcast, where we share stories to inspire, uplift, and encourage you in your peacemaking journey. I'm Becca Teibel, and I work with Peace Catalyst here in the Washington, D.C. area. And as always, I'm joined by my wonderful co-host, Allie Bernison. Hey, everyone. I'm Allie, and I am joining you from Los Angeles, California. By the way, if you have been listening to our podcast for a while, or if this is the first time listening and you just really love the episode, do us a favor and take some time to rate and review our podcast on Apple or wherever you listen. It helps boost our visibility and encourages others to find us and give us a listen as well. This week, we have a great uh, conversation for you guys to listen in on. We are chatting with Julia Basha, who is a Peabody and Guggenheim award-winning filmmaker, media strategist, and the creative director at Just Vision, an organization that fills a media gap on Israel-Palestine through independent storytelling and strategic audience engagement. She has strategically used documentary film and multimedia to foster constructive conversations on some of the most divisive issues of our times. Julia's work has been exhibited at the Sundance, Berlin, and Tribeca Film Festivals. It's been broadcast on the BBC, HBO, and Al Jazeera, and has screened at widely diverse settings from Palestinian refugee camps and villages to the halls of the American Congress and European Parliament. Her TED Talk, Pay Attention to Nonviolence, was selected as one of the best talks of 2011 by the TED curators and has been viewed by over half a million people worldwide. And also this TED Talk, uh, Pay Attention to Nonviolence, is also featured in our collaborative guide um, that we that Peace Catalyst has created, the Christian Peace Builder Network. Um, so you can definitely check it out there. Maybe you've already come across it through through being part of that group. Yeah, that that TED Talk is really incredible and yeah, highly recommend <laughs> if you haven't listened to it. It's a really great one. Um, and she also has another one about women waging nonviolent um, movements for peace as well. Um, and this week we have a peace quote, which is actually from Julia herself. It says, um, violence and nonviolence are, after all, two different forms of theater. They both depend and thrive on the response of an audience. And I think this quote will be illuminated um, after we get into this conversation with Julia a bit more. Um, really excited to hear from her today. And I had the chance to hear her speak actually in Washington, D.C. not too long ago. Um, I got to attend a screening of her most recent film, which is called Boycott, that we'll also talk about in this conversation. And I uh, just want to encourage all of us as we're diving into this conversation, you know, on the podcast, we're hearing from so many different voices and leaders, people who are engaged in peace building in a variety of contexts and ways. And, you know, there may be things that we hear that we don't really understand, or maybe we don't agree with. And I just want to remind us that that's okay. <laughs> we don't have to agree with everything that we hear from our guests, but really we just want to be able to learn from what they do have to share. And I'm reminded of like an old saying that I would hear in like my church community of, you know, chew the meat and spit out the bones. And I think that's, that's really applicable. Like there may be things that, yeah, that you're not fully, um, or there might be even like ideas that she has on certain issues that you don't share. And I think I just want to encourage us to not throw away the whole conversation because of that and to still be willing to listen and learn to um, the other aspects of the conversation. So we're excited to talk to Julia today and can't wait to hear what she has to say. Welcome, Julia, to the podcast. We are so honored to have you with us today. And i um, wondering if you could start by just sharing a little bit about yourself and your journey of getting to where you are today as a world-renowned documentary filmmaker. It's a pleasure to be here. 
I have been working as a documentary filmmaker uh, for now, I guess, almost 20 years. And um, I started off um, in Egypt when I met a filmmaker there called Jihan Nujem. She was making a documentary film about Al Jazeera's coverage of the Iraq war. At the time, this was when the United States invaded Iraq in uh, March of 2003. And I had been very active as a student um, organizing against the war. And so when I learned about her project and saw some of the footage that she had captured, I became really committed to supporting her in um, uh, realizing her vision for the project and ended up becoming the writer and editor of Control Room, which was a film that came out in 2004. Uh, it was the first exposure um, for most Americans of a different side to the war in Iraq. This was a time when um, outlets like the New York Times and other uh, liberal outlets were still supporting the war. And uh, the film helped many people understand some of the propaganda that had been fed by the American government and started questioning uh, why uh, we had um, invaded uh, Iraq with the excuses that we did. And the impact that the film had in changing some of the narratives in America around the war in Iraq really opened my eyes to the power of documentary filmmaking. And that's when I decided that that's what I wanted to do for my life. Um, I was very lucky to soon thereafter meet with Ronit Avni, who is an Israeli-Canadian human rights advocate. She, at the time, uh, was beginning um, the project called Just Vision, and uh, I became very intrigued about it. I traveled with her to Jerusalem and co-directed our first film there in Counterpoint. And uh, since then, um, I helped uh, Ronit and many of our team members uh, build the organization that I've been part of now for the past uh, 18 years. And um, Just Vision is squarely focused on the stories of Israelis and Palestinians who are uh, fighting against the occupation. Uh, that has been uh, the focus of a lot of our work. And uh, the new film that we're making now, Boycott, is actually our first documentary that takes place in the United States. So we're now expanding mm -hmm. uh, to really look at the ways in which dissent is being crushed, not only in Israel, but also beyond in the United States and in Europe. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing the your background and um, what has brought you to where you are now. You have explained a bit about Just Vision's inception and how it came to be, and then also its purpose and focus. So with that and how you've expanded, you know, um, with your latest film, Boycott. Um, so with that in mind, how, how do you decide which stories that you pursue and which stories that you highlight? Our team at Just Vision is really focused on civil society and the role that organizers at the grassroots play in changing narratives and in ultimately forcing elected officials to change policy. Um, we believe that policymakers are going to be the last ones to move, as they often are, yeah. uh, when you look at um, uh, conflict areas um, internationally and historically, but that the grassroots is really critical. And uh, social justice movements have played a key role in organizing for change, and we have seen that change happens and it's possible, um, even though these days, if you live in America, you might be feeling really um, despaired at the state of affairs. Um, but it's really important to know that um, folks organizing and getting together really works. And so we are very interested in those stories, in documenting the actions of people who are thinking creatively, courageously, taking huge risks to change the status quo. Um, and so all of our films focus on those kinds of stories. They are, uh, they are inspiring stories. Uh, they're stories that um, are surprising to most people because they generally are not considered uh, the type of news that um, uh, media outlets tend to focus when they're talking about Israel and Palestine. And we want to turn that in its head. We want to really uh, stop the, the sort of trend that you know, you only focus events when there's violence involved, or uh, when there there are elected or political leaders as the main cast of it. We really want to turn uh, this thing on its head and focus on everyday people and the power that they have mm. in building their own futures. Mm. Wow, and that makes so much sense. And I mean, with that, how 
how do you build a level of trust with these individuals, um, whoever, whoever story you're telling so that they are open enough, open and vulnerable enough to share, um, authentically and, yeah, I guess how how do you how did how does Just Vision strive to portray vulnerable people with respect and and dignity? Yeah, I mean, one of the key aspects of our work is is that our team is very much rooted on the communities whose stories we tell. So our team is made up of Palestinians, Israelis, Americans. I'm Brazilian. Uh, my producer Rula Salama, who I've worked with for 15 years, she's from Beit Hanina, which is a neighborhood in Jerusalem. And she's a journalist who has worked for her community documenting the stories on the ground uh, her entire adult life. And so she really has deep relationships of trust that people know that we're not parachuting in and out, that we're not going to be extracting uh, what we need to make a sensationalist story that we think is going to sell for Western audiences Mm -hmm. and care little about the consequences for these communities because our team is rooted in the communities. We have a stake uh, right there what happens after this film comes out and what the consequences are. Um, and so I think that is really at the core of, of how we as a team uh, operate. And, um, and we think this is critical uh, for storytellers. Mm. That's incredible. And I've, I've seen a few of, the, of your documentaries, um, including Nyla and the Uprising and Budrus and, and Boycott. Um, and I guess like thinking back to, um, your Ted talk as well, where you're talking about this idea of paying attention to nonviolence and paying attention to stories that don't get, um, put into the mainstream media or like the majority of what we see, um, especially in the Western world or Western culture. Um, and it really seems like there's sort of even a competition for our attention between violence and nonviolence. Um, so when we give our attention to one, it gives power to that one and detracts from maybe the legitimacy of the other. So if you could like maybe give an example of what's the, what is the power of giving attention to nonviolence that actually also has a positive impact on the grassroots efforts of those people and those whose, whose stories that you're telling, um, if you could kind of like illuminate that for us. Attention is the most important currency that exists today. Uh, We can talk about, you know, money uh, and obviously money matters a whole lot. But in the current way that we operate, um, particularly since the advent of social media, what you will see politicians vying for all the time is our attention. And that's unfortunately why we have ended up across the world, including in America, with these um, extremely... uh, Uh, authoritarian leaders who have come to power because they have captured the attention of the world, Uh, whether it be Bolsonaro in Brazil, Trump um, in America. These people have um, been able to play in this new currency space where if you are outrageous, you grab people's attention and that's all people talk about. We're seeing that with Elon Musk right now. All the business magazines, all they talk about is stories about Elon Musk. Mm. And he has captured attention. Now, is that really what the business stories should be about right now? This one individual? Right. I think if you were actually thinking about what's happening with the business world today, what's happening with the markets, what's the state of our capitalism, I think there's some pretty deep stories that we maybe should be talking about, about the importance of unions, about great victories that the union movement has made lately. But unfortunately, what captures our attention is Elon Musk. And that has a huge influence then on how we operate and the decisions we make. And we saw that in, you know, the, the sort of rise and meteoric fall of, um, of, uh, of um, Bitcoins, right? Mm-hmm. And how, how this, this idea of what you pay attention to ends up influencing an entire market space. Um, and that's not dissimilar to what happens with social justice movements. And when we're talking about how um, disenfranchised populations, how populations living under occupation and oppressed for generations, what do they need in order to change their situations? Oftentimes, they're living under extremely unequal conditions, like let's say Palestine and Israel, uh, where Palestinians live under occupation, 
and they're not they're not in a in a in a in a pairing stage with Israel, right? You can't. That's why it's often problematic to talk about the Israeli Palestinian conflict, which implies that you know these these two populations um, are equal to each other uh, and have equal amount of power. Um, you're talking about um, a population that has very little say into their future right now because of the way that not only uh, Israel has captured um, the, the the support of um, superpowers in the world like the United States, um, and also because um, it commands nuclear weapons and it's a, it's a massive economy, so militarily incredibly superior to this population. Hmm. So Palestinians need international support. Now, how are they going to get international support? How are they going to uh, capture the world's attention? How they're going to get people to care enough to do something about it? Um, and part of uh, what they have tried over many movements, including the first Intifada in the 1980s, which was the story of Nile India Uprising, um, my prior film, um, is to organize and mobilize uh, in ways that in the past have worked for other groups to gather the support of international communities. Um, and that, though, requires the international community to respond. Uh, and uh, we saw, you know, historically, we have a great example, which is how apartheid in South Africa ended. And um, the story there is that, um, you know, South, black South Africans organized in the 1950s, they organized a boycott movement, uh, and they called on the international community to boycott South Africa. Mm. Now, it took 35 years, 35 years until finally the boycott ended because in 1993, South Africa entered a democratization process. Um, that would have looked very differently if the international community had not paid attention and not responded to the call by South Africans to boycott apartheid South Africa until apartheid ended. They had a specific goal. They named it. They had a, a request. It was a nonviolent movement. Uh, boycotts have been used historically in the United States also by um, uh, African Americans uh, to end Jim Crow laws. Um, it has been used by farmers in America um, in order to achieve um, basic rights for farm workers. Uh, Cesar Chavez um, and Dolores Huerta were the leaders of that movement. Um, and, and those movements, though, require that the, com the international communities or domestically, in the case of the United States movements, that people respond and pay attention to it. Um, and that's the only way that these movements can grow. Um, and if uh, organizers see that their nonviolent calls are getting responses, then they, they can convince their own communities that that type of organizing works mm -hmm. and that they are going to achieve freedom. They are going to achieve liberation by using nonviolent resistance. So we have a huge responsibility to play in that. We need to be very, very thoughtful about where we spend our time, where we focus our attention. Uh, what are we reading? What are we liking? What are we sharing? What are we talking about with our friends? What do we focus on? On the, you know, sort of, uh, you know, two thirds of the 24 hours that we are up and, and alive and, and thinking about. Uh, and, and if we can... Mm -hmm. Be thoughtful about it. If we can use this currency thoughtfully, which is our attention, we have incredible amount of power mm. to change uh, the realities of, of communities on all over the world. Mm. I think it's fascinating that you talk about attention being a currency, and I would have never um, put it in those terms, but it makes just so much sense um, with your explanation um, and yeah, especially applying it to our current context. I mean, you see that play out all the time, that what gets the most attention um, seems to have the most traction and the most um, potential for changing something, whether towards um, positive or more destructive um, ends. But so you, you've we've start, we talked a little bit about uh, the power of the boycott and um, how that can, how boycotting is used ultimately to catalyze social change. Um, and so I want to first hopefully talk about, and I don't know if you would put it in those terms, so correct me, um, but I, I want to talk about your most recent uh, documentary boycott. And so can you explain a bit about the, the, the film, the intention um, and yeah. 
Boycott is a feature documentary that uh, chronicles the stories of three Americans from different political backgrounds who are suing their states because they were told that they had to sign a pledge promising not to boycott Israel. And if they refuse to sign that pledge, they would be fired from their jobs. Uh, these are Americans who have public contracts with their local governments. Um, one is a speech pathologist in Texas. The other is a lawyer in Arizona. And the third is a news publisher uh, in Arkansas. Um, this bill uh, that they uh, challenged in court currently exists in 33 states in America. Uh, so 33 states in the United States have versions of this bill that condition public employment on a particular political viewpoint regarding a foreign policy issue. These are state governments. These are local governments that enacted this bill. Uh, the film follows these three Americans in their lawsuits. Um, is a bit of a legal thriller. And it also investigates who is behind these bills. How come uh, these bills were able to pass so swiftly across the country with very little public scrutiny? Um, and the vast majority of Americans have never heard about this. Mm. And we've made the film very much wanting to sound the, the alarm bell because mm. these bills are not only threatening the right of Americans to advocate for Palestinian human rights, but now these bills are being used as a template to say in states like Texas, if you want a public contract, you need to sign a pledge that you are not boycotting the fossil fuels industry. If you want a public contract, you have to sign a pledge that you're not boycotting the firearms industry, and so on and so forth. This bill is a template to be able to crush all the social justice movements that have been able to make progress in America, particularly the environmental movement, as it started encouraging um, companies to rethink how they were supporting the fossil fuels industry. Uh, and now we're seeing a huge backlash against efforts um, to boycott and divest uh, from fossil fuels, which is one of the uh, main source of um, heating of, of our planet, which is eventually going to make, uh, you know, potentially inhabitable for future generations. Um, and so, the, again, the fact that these bills have been passing and that there's been so little attention paid to it tells you again about how are we assigning our attention and and how smartly are we thinking about what are the stories that journalists are covering? What are the stories that we, we are reading when we first you know click on the New York Times or when we're scrolling through Twitter? Uh, what are the stories that um, capture our attention and, and that we like to click on and, and want to, to look at? Because when we click on something, when we like something, what we are uh, asking for is, yes, please give me more of this. Mm -hmm. That's the information that we are conveying to the social media platforms, that's the information we're conveying to the media outlets, to journalists, uh, to politicians about what we care about. Um, and so every time that we make one of these actions, we are giving feedback about what we want more of. Um, and the fact that these laws were able to pass and Americans don't know about this and with huge consequences for our ability to fight for the environmental movement, for safety in our schools. So now you can't boycott the firearms industry anymore. This was something done obviously with um, you know lobbying by the NRA. Um, and, and this is gonna continue to be using to be used as a template, um, because it's you basically just need to copy and paste whatever uh, issue area you want to crush. You can just um, you can just put it in, and uh, and unfortunately is is passing uh, with lightning speed across the country. Mm. I just as a quick follow up question. I'm, I mean, it's obvious the harm, um, the the implied harm, the the ramifications. But I'm curious in your words and from your perspective, what would you say is the thing, the one thing or however you want to state it, that's at stake when this form of advocacy is not present, when when we don't have the power to boycott certain issues, institutions, mm -hmm. countries? Boycotts have been used uh, historically to and create 
some of the, you know, most powerful and beautiful social change that I think we like to celebrate, right? Yeah, you know, civil rights in America, um, which is obviously something we're still working on. Uh, but the, the huge, you know, landmark changes that were able to happen as a result of the, you know, things like the Montgomery bus boycotts mm -hmm. or the boycotts against white businesses in Port Gibson, Mississippi, um, you know, boycotts of, um, of grapes uh, organized by Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta when they saw the conditions um, that Latino workers were facing in California uh, on the fields. And they asked Americans to boycott those grapes until uh, their bosses Give, gave them basic human rights as part of, of, of their working conditions, and they won. Boycotts work. Boycotts are an effective tool um, when there is nothing else left. Mm. Um, and they are a particularly effective tool for disenfranchised communities who can organize and bend together and have their voices heard by asking other communities to join on them as in an act of solidarity. Um, so this is about collective action. Boycotts is, is a form of collective expression. When an individual's voice by themselves wouldn't be able to be heard, they can come together and advocate together by withholding um, uh, their support uh, and sending a very clear message that uh, they want change to be created. Thanks for thanks for sharing all of that with us. And um yeah, kind of enlightening us on this issue. Because I, I remember when I watched that documentary boycott here in DC, it was it was so eye opening because I didn't understand like the larger scope of of what was going on and how that was going to impact all these different um, issues that people care about and are advocating for. So um, I guess this is kind of more of like a, a fun question, but whenever you're making films, what's the most like life-giving aspect of that process for you or what's your favorite part? I mean, I, I feel incredibly privileged that all the films that I do are about telling stories of amazing people. And so the idea that, you know, I get to learn about what motivates individuals to despite the most challenging odds be courageous and take huge risk to create a better world uh, just gives me more inspiration and, and moves me forward and keeps me going uh, so really the best part of the job for me is spending time with with you know people that I am chronicling and that I am documenting and then once the film is done uh, having you know the privilege of traveling with them and going uh, to different cities and states and countries and presenting the film and speaking uh, alongside them during the Q and A's and seeing other people and other audiences getting hugely inspired um, by by their stories. So mm -hmm. I, I I I love that process. That's awesome. And I guess for oh for our listeners, you know, how can they see the films that you've created and and also present them to the people in their communities? Mm -hmm. So if they visit justvision.org, that's J U S T V I S I O N dot O R G, uh, they can uh, click on the films tab and they will be able to uh, see where they can watch each of the films. Uh, most of the films are available online at this point, uh, except for Boycott, which is our latest documentary that is still in the film festival circuit and will be released online in a few months. But if they would like to uh, organize a screening for their communities of Boycott, they can get in touch with us because we're launching the community and educational campaign of the film in the fall. And we want to come to houses of worship, to campuses, community groups, um, women's organizations, uh, wherever you bring people together, even if it's in your living room, uh, you can request for a screening of Boycott in the fall of 2022. Uh, and in the meantime, Nile India Uprising is available on Google Play, on Apple TV. Um, Budrus is available on, um, on Amazon. Um, so all of the film, My Neighborhood is available on uh, The Guardian and also on the Just Vision website. So all of the other films are, are readily um, available online. Thank you so awesome. much. I'm curious um, if there is something, anything that you would like to leave our audience or something that you want people to be thinking about. Um, is there any sort of application or um, exhortation, <laughs> challenge maybe even? 
Mm -hmm. Um, I would encourage people to really pay attention to what's happening in their local governments. I think as we just saw with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, um, a lot of these organizing efforts to um, uh, take away our rights start at the state level and then become national. And there, there is an incredible um, opportunity there. I, I spent a lot of time in, in state legislatures um, while I was making the film for three years. And it's a huge, huge vacuum. Uh, there's very little people showing up uh, for the hearings, paying attention to what the new bills are, advocating against bills that want to take away more rights. Um, and if you show up, you will, you will get a hearing because nobody is there. And so your voice really matters at your local state government. So I would encourage people um, to figure out what are the bills coming up, read up on them, show up, call your local representative um, and, and, and believe that your voice really matters. I've seen it really matter when one or two or three people uh, show up to advocate for an issue. Yeah, that's great. That's such great practical advice for us. And um, also important to, you know, connect with those issues that really do affect us and that, that affect our neighbors and people that we really care about. Um, and I love what you're saying to show up and, and take action because a lot of us have many feelings and thoughts, but to actually put that into action is, is another step. So thank you so much, Julia. We are so grateful to um, have this time with you today and just loved hearing from you and learning from you. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Wow. That was incredible. I loved getting to like see her face to face virtually and hear. Yeah, that so many so many things to think about and reflect on from that conversation. Um, yeah. What, what stood out to you, Ali, or what was most impactful for you? Yeah. Um, oh my goodness. So many things. First of all, I am with you in, in being able to talk to her. I remember at Fuller when I was in a class and we watched, um, and now I'm blanking on, on what class it was actually, but um, one of the things we did is we watched Boudreaux and, um, so it was just so crazy. I feel like if you would have told me back then that I would have <laughs> talked to the filmmaker, I wouldn't, um, have necessarily believed you. So it's very cool that we got to have a conversation <laughs> with her and hear more about her journey, um, to where she is now and the amazing stories she's been able to tell and people that she's been able to cross paths with and, um, life stories that she's been able to uplift. And so I think with that, um, one thing that I am really thinking about is both for myself and for our audience, like the very simple encouragement. Um, although in practice, you know, it's, it's not so simple because I think so many times, so many, so often we might passively, we might passively consume stories and, you know, media content through various channels, you know, through interpersonal interactions, face to face or through social media feeds. Um, and so I think her encouragement of like, pay attention to what you're paying attention to, um, is just taken mm -hmm. in, it's definitely taken, um, with, weight and it, or it should be taken with, with weight and with consideration. Um, and I, yeah, so I, I think that's, that's what I'm left with is just the, um, reminder that the stories that we are telling and, um, what simply what we're talking about with our friends, um, that matters. And, paying attention to what sides of the story we're seeing. Um, because it's, you know, it very well might be that we're not hearing the entire reality or, you know, it is likely the case that we're not seeing the entire picture, the whole, the whole picture, and we're just getting bits and pieces. Um, and so I think caring mm -hmm. about that, you know, whether it's a particular social 
issue, um, something that's either on our radar or like, you know, that we're, we're like not super engaged in. Um, I think, yeah, I think just pay attention. Um, and you know, whether that is simply like do something with the, the podcast that you're listening to now and watch, Mm. watch the film and share it with friends. And I mean, you know, pay attention to the documentary and, you know, consider just what, what you said at the top of the episode, you know, consider, consider it with, um, consider the things that you agree with and the things that are like, huh, I don't know about that. Um, just, yeah, be engaged in what you're hearing. I think that's, and I don't know if, if that's so vague that it's almost not like a good takeaway, but I guess that's what I'm thinking about still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so good. I, I like that a lot. Like continue to be engaged and choose to put yourself in a place of learning and exploring and not feeling like, yeah, we don't have to have all the answers, but like, can we choose to, um, listen and I've also yeah I I, from our conversation with her was reflecting on like you know what stories am I choosing to uplift or amplify or highlight and like how does that impact how we see things and um, it's really important I think especially in contexts of like you know well I'm thinking about Israel Palestine because of um you know a lot of the focus of just vision is is on that conflict in particular so thinking about like um yeah what does it look like if we're you know highlighting stories that can amplify like peace or can amplify nonviolence and um the impact that that can have and um and anywhere in the world I mean sharing stories that do uplift those grassroots efforts of people who are pursuing peace or pursuing Mm -hmm. social change. Um, And yeah, so I think um, one thing that I was reflecting on from Julia's um, conversation was like this idea that, you know, the film boycott was really incredible. And I think it's, it is a really important conversation because it, it's not just about like this one idea of like boycotting one country because of um, human rights or whatever right. people are advocating for, but it's like setting a legal precedence within the U S for any saying that. And she explained that. Um, right. And I think, yeah, and I think that's really important, but I also think it's important to recognize like with, boycotting Israel like there's a lot more to it than just you know it's not just like this black and white issue because of course at least I don't think it is um like I don't want to delegitimize like genuine nonviolent efforts to bring about justice or bring about social change humanitarian change like I think that's really important and I do hold a value for it but I also think it can get conflated in this context, unfortunately, and can very easily become, um, yeah, even like anti-Semitic. And um, I know this is like a big statement. So, (laughs) but I think just approaching with like empathy for everybody involved, because I know on this recent Talos trip to Israel and Palestine, we visited, you know, the Holocaust uh, museum there called Yad Vashem. And of course, I've been to this museum several times. I've been to the Holocaust Museum here in D.C. several times. Um, and of course, we grew up learning about the Holocaust. But there is something about that. It just something that I read in the museum that just got me thinking more reflectively on like this idea of boycott in particular. And it was that like before the Holocaust in Germany, the first like repressive action or oppressive action taken against the Jews was a boycott. Um, And so like that is very clearly like, you know, a part of this narrative of like, okay, now you're choosing to boycott us again. Right. Then that, you know, and I'm sure a lot of like boycott activists would say, no, we're not boycotting Jewish people. We're boycotting this government or the state that we find. But of course, like, identity is um I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert on that I'm just reflecting like my own yeah just reflections um on that in particular so I just wanted to add that because I think it's important to have 
nuance um, in this conversation in particular. But absolutely, yeah, I I really appreciate you bringing that up and re- and bringing up your experience um, in Israel Palestine because I yeah I I just want to echo what what you just said, which probably doesn't need to be echoed, but um, because you just said it. <laughs> But yes, yes, um, yes to all of it. The the issue is very complex. And, um, you know, one thing that we were chatting about briefly before this conversation was um, that, you know, not not every, you know, we can, we're not saying yes to every boycott, meaning like, you know, we have to still be discerning and, um, nuance in our approach to issues and, you know, and still examine the ends or, um, you know, who, who is benefiting, who, um, like, like what's at stake, Mm -hmm. you know? And I, yeah, I think, so I I appreciate that you brought that up, um, with this conversation Mm -hmm. being so incredibly, um, difficult, difficult to, to tackle, um, in its entirety. And so, right. yeah, so, so thank you for saying that. Yeah. And, and I don't mean that in a way of like detracting from like the documentary or like the right. purpose, which, which right. is to ensure that people have freedom of speech and freedom to, if somebody decides that they want to boycott a certain product um, because of a human rights issue, like I think we should have the freedom to do that. But I think, yeah, unfortunately with with this context, it gets a little bit um, hairy. Mm-hmm. Um, at least that's my understanding. So, yeah. 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 Absolutely. But we would definitely encourage you guys to um, to check out this film and to share it with people in your community, in your network, to interact with it in a way that is meaningful and, and reflective. Um, and, but then, you know, with, with everything that you're consuming and I'm not saying this, I'm saying this to myself too, um, <laughs> to, to, um, be thinking deeply about, yeah, what, where our attention is going and, um, those mm-hmm. movements that are nonviolent and, um, working towards a just order of society. Like, can, can we give those, um, those movements and those efforts are attention. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. that's my, that's what I'm telling myself at least. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, there's so many other great documentaries that Julia has made with just vision, like Nyla and the uprising. Like we talked about Bedrus, my neighborhood, like there's so many amazing stories. Mm-hmm. It's not just this most recent film. Like I would definitely, yeah, of course, recommend looking at all of them and, um, finding a way to watch them and, and share those stories with your friends yep. and even just in general whatever the topic may be or the issue may be like just being very reflective on like is what I'm sharing right now contributing to shalom or is it possibly detracting from it or like yeah what is this adding to the conversation yeah yeah it's a great a great question, a great way to kind of like filter through what we're seeing and hearing. Um, yeah, so thank you for that too. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen to podcasts. And for more info about Peace Catalyst and to help support our peacebuilding work, please visit our website at peacecatalyst.org.